So, uh, Stefan, you've been working for over 30 years on uh, your theory of love. Yes, yes, I have. And uh, so at times it was a lonely journey, to be honest. Uh, uh, but I got a lot of support from friends and colleagues, and uh, that kind of kept me going. And uh, really what I've been doing, Serge, is uh, – and by the way, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, what I've been doing is um, – Looking at the implications and the applications of this idea, uh, I, I spent almost a year with a couple of graduate students uh, researching everything we could to make sure that I wasn't duplicating something that was already out there and thinking that I have something new uh, because I thought uh, it, it, it was quite an important revelation in a sense, uh, insight into uh, our nature. So, uh, uh, that, that is what my work has been. Uh, looked at, uh, uh, its implication and application, for instance, to child development and out of that parenting and then out of that the whole educational system. Uh, then, uh, spent uh, more than a couple of years, I would say maybe even as much as five years, putting together uh, a psychotherapy training because it clearly for me had tremendous implications uh, for uh, psychotherapeutic intervention. Uh, I actually think on some level uh, people come to psychotherapy uh, to buy 45 minutes of unconditional love. Uh, where else can you sit and uh, be accepted and be supported and not made wrong and not judged and be listened to uh, it proactively, uh, you know, which to me, uh, in terms of my theory, these are all aspects <clears throat> of my theory of love is nourishment. So people come for 45 minutes, pay to be nourished uh, with this love. So, to, so yeah. I want to I want to highlight this that sense of mm -hmm. love is nourishment is yes. the big point and yes. as you point out uh, in uh, talks we've had um, it's not a metaphor it's not an as if but it's something that uh, is literal literally true literally true um, uh, it it wasn't until Fredrickson published her book Love 2.0 uh that uh you could say uh some level of research was applied to the theory indirectly because it doesn't seem like she was aware of my work or my concept that love is nourishment like air food and water literally and again we know that Eric Fromm in his art of loving in the 50s wrote human beings are starved for love but I'm sure we all figured that it's figuratively. It's not meant literally. But in her book, uh, she said that she did an eight-year research with loving-kindness meditation, and her conclusion was basically my hypothesis, that love is nourishment like air, food, and water. So since then, I have felt a little less alone. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, when we really look around, we have many things that uh, can be brought in to also substantiate this idea. For instance, we have something called psychosocial dwarfism. Uh, a lack of growth hormones is the way it was identified. Why kids were small of stature and their brains didn't develop fully. But then it turned out, looking a little closer, that most of these children, not all, most of them came from emotionally barren homes where they weren't being loved. And when they took them out of those homes, many of these children in a more loving environment literally started to go free, uh, grow physically and their brain started to develop. So it, basically the same thing that happens when you have malnourished children and then you start to give them the right amount of nourishment, food, water, etc., etc., along with love. Uh, then we have uh, another component we can look at and that's tissue regeneration. Um, we have uh, uh, 
studies with uh, what we would call uh, uh, cell activation, wound healing. And in these studies, we also find that our, our environment and the way we behave and the way people behave towards us uh, uh, helps. Uh, and then, and then, of course, with with the, the importance of of support uh, uh, in terms of cancer survival. Now, when we we use the word support, but what does it mean when people have a large loving community around them? Aren't they getting love? So uh, maybe one of the first things that I should do here is just to talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, the difference between the way I use love as nourishment and probably the way most people are used to hearing it, uh, which is in the romantic context. So when, when we, when we look at uh, the physiology of, uh, of romance, basically it's a biological energy. It's involuntarily generated. We're attracted to somebody. There is desire, passion, uh, and it's a procreative energy, but it doesn't nourish. Uh, it, it, what it does is generates dopamine, adrenaline, right? We call it the adrenaline rush. It's, it's driven by pheromones. So, uh, that, that is what I call the, the physiology of romance, as mm-hmm. opposed to the physiology of nurturing love. Now, it, that, uh, again, by definition, is a life-sustaining energy. Uh, and there are things we know about orphanages and infants, uh, crib death, uh, that, again, point to, uh, in Romania, for instance, uh, when the Ceausescu communist regime fell, they had tons. I mean, every small town almost had an orphanage because he encouraged people to have children. He wanted to populate the country, make it, make it a big, big population, powerful country. So, and he said he will take care of the children. So people had children that they couldn't actually support. They went into these orphanages. And one of the things that they found uh, when when uh, uh, relief services and these people kind of came in to help Romania uh, during that period is there was a very high rate of crib death. And they couldn't figure out why. They thought, well, maybe they're... Uh, killing the kids or they're, they're doing something so they put in cameras to see if maybe at night they're coming around with pillows or what are, what are, what are they doing and no they found that the, the caretakers were changing them they were clean they were being fed and they were dying and That's the only it. thing that yeah the only thing they could figure out is what they weren't being they weren't being held yeah they weren't they weren't so, being loved yes sir. so 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 here uh, clearly by its absence, we see mm-hmm. the nurturing role can that love can have. Yeah. But you're making a big distinction between romantic love, attraction, um, versus nurturing love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I mean, we have uh, in the Greek we have uh, familial, and we have eros. You know, we have mm-hmm. kind of the distinction uh, and. Uh, 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 same thing here. I mean, what happens really is that we, when we behave lovingly with people and they be, behave lovingly with us, and that list of behaviors is, can be quite long, but what it does is it generates a whole different set of chemicals and hormones as opposed to adrenaline, dopamine, pheromones. What we get is oxytocin and endorphins, vasopressin, and this is done by conscious awareness. Our loving behavior is conscious. It's not automatic the way um, it, it may be instinctual, but it's not automatic. And these, I mean, we even call oxytocin the love hormone now. Mm-hmm. Um, so they 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 uh, nourish our immune system and our growth hormones and wound healing and uh, the, you know, from epigenetics, we know that it has a lot to do with longevity, uh, again, cancer survival. So when we start to put the whole picture together, it does start looking like there is something going on when we're in an environment of when we're uh, receiving love, 
uh, that we're being nourished. And by the way, we do say mother's love nourishes. But again, we probably think of it more figuratively uh, rather than uh, literally. Right, right. But so you're, you're saying that um, uh, unlike romantic love, uh, nourishing love is something that may be instinctive but is actually a choice, is, uh, is, is a mindful decision. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and that mindfulness needs to come from ourselves. So when you look at this as, as a, a hypothesis or a truth and then you begin to work with this concept, uh, what do we know about nourishment? Well, I have a couple of grandchildren, and I will tell you the, the cutest thing to watch when they're little is trying to hold a cup, trying to learn how to use a knife and a fork. Uh, you know, they go and they pull open the refrigerator when they're two years old to grab something, right? We, we actually teach human beings how to nourish themselves, how to become self-sufficient with nourishment. And even though uh, we may talk about education and a career, but what is education and a career about bottom line? Well, it's about making money so that you can feed yourself. You can become independent. You get money. You buy money. You cook your own food and you eat your own food. As parents, we have done our job. We have a self-sufficient human being taking care of what? Well, Number one, their nourishment needs. So by implication, when do we ever teach a human being to love themselves? And the answer is never. It's actually the opposite. We, we, we have, and I, I think it's, this is, it has, goes back two million years and I don't want to get into, uh, the anthropological, uh, development of, of humanity. But we don't like when people are selfish, self-centered, egotistical. And when I teach and I use that word self-love, people have a resistance to that word. Uh, it kind of gives people a, a bad taste in their mouth. And the way I work around that is I ask them, when you're hungry, do you go to the refrigerator and get yourself something to eat? They look at me. It's not a trick question. It's just straightforward. And well, of course, of course. Well, yeah, you do because you're the only one who knows when you're hungry and you've been taught how to be self-sufficient, take care of that particular need. What does somebody who feels the need for love do? What refrigerator can they go to? There isn't any. What if people around them have rejected them or they feel that they have been rejected? Where, where do you go for this nourishment? And the answer is we need to teach human beings if we accept this as a fact that love is nourishment. Like air food. We have to teach human beings to love themselves. Mm-hmm. So I started working with that concept. And I will tell you, Serge, um, the most incredible thing initially when I would say to somebody, well, you know, you, you deserve love and you deserve it unconditionally for absolutely no reason. They would break down and start crying. And, and, and the amount of pain that we carry around, even when we come from more loving homes, is quite a bit because we're taught not to love ourselves. It's a sin. Uh, and families move from being unconditional, which again, if we understand human development, that must be our instinctual approach to an infant without knowing we're nourishing them because we're being so loving and unconditional with them. And these family uh, environments morph, we call it terrible twos, they morph into conditional more and more and more conditional because we have a mind of our own and a will of our own and not all children are compliant and whatever, you know, whatever and whoever they are, parents are tired, uh, they don't have, they don't love themselves, uh, they don't have a good relationship with each other, uh, on and on. They have problems at work and since we don't know how important it is to be loving, towards a child unconditionally, even when we're upset and angry with them, uh, we behave conditionally. And those instances, 
those instances are incredibly painful. I'm going to give you a couple of other things. Uh, uh, I, I see that you would like I wanted to. to I wanna, yeah. yeah, I wanted to say, uh, as we're coming there, so this is the background of um, how people come to therapy in lots of ways to address mm-hmm. this. Yes. So I'm curious about um, how you use this framework. Uh, in therapy, and you've alluded to something of telling somebody that, you know, they have the right to be loved, Um, Mm -hmm. but just could you maybe give a little bit, flesh out a little bit more of how this might color your approach to therapy? Well, the first thing when somebody comes to me, uh, because I'm already looking and I've been working with this for 30 years, so I have tremendous amount of evidence for the fact that this is uh, a fundamental uh, 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 cause of of the symptoms. You know, the symptoms are many: depression, anxiety, anger, uh, self destructive behavior, addictions. Uh, it goes on and on. And I look at someone and and I assume that uh, by starting the process with with love. Uh, that it, it, it will give me a window into a lot of things that happen. So the, one of the first things I do when they come to me, besides explaining that love is nourishment and that, uh, uh, therefore what that means is that you first and foremost need to learn to love yourself, nourish yourself just like you do with air, food and water. Uh, and that, and, 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 and as soon as they hear that and some stuff, immediately stuff comes up about their mother or their father or, you know, things like that, that, uh, So, so in a way, it's as if, you know, they're coming and you say, okay, so the, what you're talking about are symptoms and the underlying right. condition is you're malnourished. Uh, yeah, not necessarily malnourished in terms of food, but in terms of love. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, Let's just pause there for one second and let's take a look at the human organism because, you know, like Carl Rogers says, you know, one thing we can do is trust our experience, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it takes our organism a couple of days or more to begin to signal us that there is pain when when food and water are absent. Mm -hmm. We start to, right? you know, the, the painful, uh, I, I founded an organization called Impact on Hunger many years ago, and I lived with hunger and starvation uh, 24-7 for eight years. So it takes the body uh, about 30 seconds to a minute to signal that there is a lack of oxygen, pain. Do you know how long it takes the body, I'm talking about somatic, Mindfulness, how long it takes the body to signal that there is a lack of love, there's a deprivation of love? Tell me. What? A nanosecond? <laughs> a second? So, so that has to tell us how important, how essential this is, because we are so sensitive to it. No, so just let's check a little bit. When you say a deprivation of love, um, are you talking about, you know, um, Absence of love, or are you talking about hostility or uh, being ignored, or just what do you mean by... Well, uh, hostility, being ignored, since we're not taught to love ourselves, that's kind mm-hmm. of where we come from, and, and we grow up in a conditional environment, which if it takes a second for our bodies to signal that uh, we're without love... Uh, in a conditioned environment, we're going to get those signals quite often, uh, even in a one-day period. Uh, so all of those things, all of those things, it's like a switch. Uh, we're very loving when we're happy uh, and content with life and what the child or the other person is doing. Uh, but the minute we don't like it, the minute for some reason it disappoints us, upsets us, they say something, they do something, we literally turn the switch off. And that's okay. my analogy. Turn okay, the switch so, on, turn the switch off. And we sense it. Okay, so, so what you're talking about is essentially a typical scene of right. a parent uh, seems to be very connected to the child, very loving, 
the child does something that the parent objects to, and suddenly there is a coldness in the air or something, yes. and uh, and you have that moment of rupture and attunement, um, yes. and that. So what you're talking about is we're highly sens- sensitive to the uh, rupture and attunement. I just absolutely. wanted to I just wanted to clarify what you right. meant by how yes. quickly we respond to lack of love and to specifically what you mean by that. Yeah, and and you're absolutely correct. You're framing it out and using words that I think a lot of people uh, uh, will understand. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm talking about. See, we can use the word attunement, but what what causes that rupture in the attunement? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. This is why I feel this is one of the most fundamental things and it's missing. And so how can we build on when the foundation and the fundamental thing isn't even uh, recognized, acknowledged, you know, uh, as, as a thing? Uh, uh, another analogy I think that's very good for your audience is, for instance, sound. We don't see sound. We don't see it sound. It's an intentioned energy. We generate it. And somehow, we never understood until the machinery came around, somehow the other person was able to sense this energy and make sense of this energy. Well, if you think about love, yes, we can't see it, but it's the same. It's an intentioned energy, and somehow we're able to sense it. We have a visceral, physical reaction. Somebody just smiles, a stranger can smile at you, kind of feels nice. We sense it. It's a little bit of love. It's not a great amount of love. Mm-hmm. You know, there there are foods that deliver a tremendous amount of nutritious energy, and there are some foods that deliver very little, or they may even be unhealthy foods. You know, kind of like unhealthy uh, behaviors towards ourselves. You know, that turning that switch off. Mm-hmm. 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 So yeah. you know, so, yeah. So so that that I I follow you there. So just let's talk a little bit about then what you do How? next in therapy. So, right. so you know, first we've talked about that sense of um, saying, okay, there's a problem about the nourishment, the lack of love. And mm-hmm. you say people come back and say, oh, yeah, it reminds me of this or that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And so so I, I, I look at that and I build with that and it's incre- again incredible how receptive people are how almost relieved they are like they can breathe the fact that they can actually talk about love that's been missing in their life and and of course missing because they've never been taught how to love themselves and they're constantly looking into their environment you know for for this love uh so one of the things i say to them is Let's make a list of your lovable qualities. What are the things that you really like about yourself? Well, there, there isn't anything. There isn't anything. Or they struggle with coming, writing down two, three things. Or it, the whole idea makes them so uncomfortable that they have to, and, and it's kind of like, and I try not to pull too many out at the beginning because I want them to think about. I tell them, all right, take your three lovable qualities and show it to some friends or family. See if you're right, you know. Maybe you put something down that they don't perceive, or maybe you forgot some. And then they come back uh, uh, the week later, and all of a sudden they got a list, you know, 15 long, and they never thought that uh, that their mother or father or a sibling or a spouse uh, uh, had positive thoughts about them, about their lovable qualities. So what I work on initially very much is this awareness of worthiness, your lovable qualities. And by the way, uh, uh, I'm very averse to using substitute words because – it means it's meaningless to a client. They're not coming here to fix their attachment issues. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're they're coming here because they don't feel loved. They they're they're struggling, and then whatever other things. Well, I'm having a problem with this. It almost always goes back to this sense of self, this lack of sensing one's self worth, self esteem. Um, inability to to care about themselves, self care, self support. These are the things that are missing, and what's underneath this is self love. 
mm-hmm. self-love. So, so what I'm hearing is that um, essentially, even aside from any intervention, uh, the major thing is if you think in terms of love and you introduce that head-on to the client, uh, you establish a connection with the fundamental problem. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm, let, let me give you an example. I had a client today, and the client came uh, uh, maybe a month and a half ago and basically uh, was saying that uh, even though she loves her husband, she's ready to get out of the relationship. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, that, that's something that, uh, uh, you know, as, as a therapist, uh, you, you want to help this person avoid that, especially if, if you actually can verbalize feelings for this person. And still we started with the lovable qualities and then maybe what are some of you not so lovable and then to show it to people. And she did and she got, you know, her list kind of grew, uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, people get to understand, because we have this list of lovable and unlovable qualities, understanding that this nurtures and nourishes you, this is what you need, this makes you feel deprived of, and it produces anxiety and all other, like disrespect. So, okay, and uh, uh, she, she had to go away for like about three weeks. So, okay, the kids went to camp and a trip and everything like that, and... Uh, there was a very serious, um, uh, what she considered kind of a serious disrespect issue uh, with uh, her husband and money. That he, he was really monitoring and supervising and questioning uh, uh, her, her, her spending habits or what she was spending on. So the first thing we figured out a while ago is, so... Give him a list of all the things you always, you know, you have to pay for school, you have to pay for this, you have to pay. make a list so that if that shows up on his radar, he knows that's a monthly or weekly kind of expense and that will help him. So, you know, she did that, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it didn't really stop. So she uh, confronted him and she said, look, I love you. And I want to be in this relationship, but not, not this way. Because it makes me feel like a child. It, you know, it, it, it's not comfortable. And, you know, she used a number of things. What she really did is she took responsibility for getting the respect that she felt she yeah. wasn't getting and needed. And she came in today and, and she told me the whole story and he woke up. He just, I'm so sorry. I never realized that you, you know, kind of felt that way. Now, she has not been trained how to communicate because, uh, because I do that. And the context of every communication is, I know that you love me and you know that I love you. And when you don't preface every, especially problems, obviously, with that, then I teach them that uh, the problem takes over the whole relationship. And you dropped out the most important piece, which is the context. You have to start with that because that will make somebody open up and listen to what you have to say. Otherwise, you're really saying, I don't love you, you don't love me, and da-da-da-da-da about the checkbook. So she she started with that, uh, and he was able to hear her. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they were, I mean, I was so proud of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, what I'm hearing from this is that, um, uh, one is there was some work you did with her, uh, in order to see herself as worthy of love. Mm -hmm. And that came from her paying attention to what she thought other people might find lovable on her. Mm -hmm. but also uh, in interacting with friends uh, so that she was able to actually get a better understanding of what the relationship was with these friends and saw the love that might not have been visible to her before. Mm -hmm. And from that place of strengthening her sense of being lovable, Mm -hmm. um, she was able to apply uh, the principle of confronting in a loving way, uh, mm-hmm. that is first, in a way, reassuring the other person that there's love, mm-hmm. and then going to the issue, 
And that in itself helped the resolution of the issue. It seems. (laughs) Yes, yes. I mean, you're framing it absolutely correctly. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. And now, when people hear unconditional, this is another kind of red flag for people. Some people say it's impossible. Well, if you've never been in an unconditional relationship, like 99.9% of people haven't, even the most loving relationships are conditional to some degree, uh, then, of course, it would be uh, uh, normal, <laughs> you know, to think that it was impossible. What, what I explain to people is that that needs to be the goal. It's a continuum from totally conditional to totally unconditional is a continuum. Most of us are probably somewhere in the middle of this. But if you don't set that as your goal, you will never begin to even move in that direction. That has to be the vision. That has to be the goal. And again, mothers are capable and and sometimes fathers are being unconditional. So clearly, we have it in us. We have the capacity to be unconditional, but it's really trained out of us. And especially as we're defending ourselves constantly from a a conditional environment. Yeah, Yeah. and one of the ways we do it is by be- being conditional back. You know, right. you hurt my feelings. Well, then uh, I'll distance myself. And uh, I had one. Uh, uh, so, so hold on. I just want to check. Yeah, We're sorry. coming to the end. I just want to check okay. if this was a good place to end, or if you want to add something uh, before we do. Yeah, I, I, I would love to, uh, if it's okay with yeah, you. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I had a graduate uh, student uh, who was uh, an I- interning with me for almost a year. Uh, she was waiting to be accepted into a, a, a PhD program, which she was. And I'm happy to say a lot of my uh, uh, interns uh, get accepted, uh, which I'm very happy for them and, and kind of proud of myself. But she she had just gotten married, and she was a very uh, – uh, uh, interested in and, and curious and kind of eager, uh, to, to learn this theory. Uh, uh, she, she was in the field of psychology, obviously, and so she was interested in, in learning, learning, learning. So, um, uh, one day I said to her, what do you do when you get angry? She says, well, you know, sometimes I, I get loud, but most of the time I just walk away, walk into the other room. So I said, well, you know that love is nourishment, and you know that the reason the two of you got married was because you were both looking for an unconditional relationship, which you haven't had since infancy. So the the adrenaline and dopamine might have brought you together, but what really cemented the deal was that you worked so hard in staying in this sexually interesting relationship plus you liked each other's personality etc etc uh, that you behaved actually unconditionally you were appreciative you were acknowledging encouraging uh, you were patient with each other you, you know you, you were as unconditional as people could be during the dating during the engagement in a honeymoon period etc etc that's why you came together he needs your love and you need his his love. And so when you feel he's not being loving, he says the wrong things, then you walk away. But the fact is, he needs your love. So what I want you to do the next time you have an upset is go up to him, take his hand and say, you know, I'm, I'm very upset right now because of what you said. Uh, but I really would like to, you know, talk about it and see if we can resolve it. Well, she came back the next day. Uh, she tried to speak. She couldn't. She sat down. She started to cry. <laughs> mm. and even as I say it, you know, I, I, I kind of feel it. And she said, oh, my God, it completely, completely changed what normally happens. I I got upset, but instead of walking away, and of course, initially, I'm sorry, when I said this, I said, I can't do that. I can't do that when I'm angry to go over and actually touch him. And I said, well, yeah, you you want to make it an experiment. You want to be a psychologist. Do the experiment. See what happens. So she said, I, you know, I went over there and I touched him and we talked and we both cried and, and, it, and it was so silly. And so... This is – the thing I wanted to do, Serge, um, 
is is to just because if we started to talk about conditional and unconditional, and what I wanted to do is just give a definition because most people uh, uh, basically, like I said, have this sense of uh, it's it's not something that uh, uh, you know we we can uh, attain. You know that it's not something we can attain. So uh, uh, I have a definition. Conditional love, which is our present state, this is where we are. This is where I am, by the way. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm not going to profess to be an unconditional human being. Uh, and and it what it is is giving and accepting loving energy only when you are pleased with someone's behavior rather than under any and all circumstances. So when we're upset, it's not only that we don't give it, but we don't want to receive it. We're in a rejecting mode. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. Don't da 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 da. Conditional. The goal is unconditional behavior. Consciously, consistently given, accepting, loving energy, even under painful, upsetting, and disappointing circumstances. And that is the goal. That is what we want to work towards. So, so I want to, to tweak a little bit. I love what you said, especially as it came after the example of that intern of yours, mm-hmm. which was a very beautiful example. Um, and I want to tweak it a little bit because I'm among the people who are a bit uncomfortable about the concept of totally unconditional love as some kind of a totally, you know, superhuman ideal. And, right. and, and, and I think we're not far apart in terms of how we think, but a tweak of language for me would be to take what you said and say that there is a bit of a leap of faith there, uh, or a Pascalian wager, uh, that, uh, for instance, to take the case of your intern, uh, you know, her normal default behavior when she's upset is to go away, withhold love. Right. And what you're telling her is to say, look, it may not work, but try it, because mm-hmm. if it works, it's going to be so good that it's worth the effort. And okay. so, so in that <laughs> like sense, that. you know, you don't even have to buy into the fact that there is such a thing as unconditional love. You bypass the discussion, but you have the pragmatic opportunity to see, isn't it worth it? Yes. I love it. I, I love the way you framed it. And by the way, what, what comes up for people, uh, I don't know if, if you know this, but in 2014, the number one Googled search phrase mm-hmm. was, what is love? Now, on the one hand, everybody thinks they know what love is. Right. But look at how many people, what are they really saying when they're saying, what is love? And the way I interpret it is, why can't I get it? Why don't I have any control over this thing that I seem to need so much? And, of course, the answer is loving yourself, which, is, of course, is written everywhere. It's been written five million times that you have to love yourself before you can love another person. But now the question comes up, how? How do you love yourself? And my answer to that is we know how to love a best friend. That's why they're a best friend. Just be your own best friend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and start paying attention to your behavior towards yourself. Is it loving? Is it unloving? Is it loving? If you're not critical of your best friend, why be critical of yourself? If you're not impatient with your best friend, why be impatient with yourself? If you encourage your best friend, try encouraging yourself. So that that may be a a little bit of that. That's a how-to. How how do I love myself? (laughs) Become your own best friend, right? Okay. Uh, the uh, the other part of the whole equation here is that when we stop being dependent on others, it's much easier to accept their flaws. It's much easier not to get upset when they do something unloving, when they turn off the light switch, because they will do it, and we will do it. But when we have learn to love ourselves or we're on that path of learning to love ourselves it's so much easier to accept the faults and flaws of other people and then to actually go to them and say this is unacceptable behavior I know you love me but and I know you didn't do it on purpose this is the hard one 
I know you didn't do it on purpose. This is a hard one, Mm -hmm. right? Because it's an adult. So, of course, they do everything consciously and on purpose. And the fact is zero, right? It's it's eyes open, asleep. Right, right, right. That's what we are, eyes open, asleep. So, you know, when when they start to understand that when people do unloving things, it's usually uh, a kind of automatic behavior. It's not really conscious. So then they, then they can say, I know you love me. I know you didn't do it on purpose to hurt my feelings. Totally unacceptable. Here are the consequences. The next time, you know, we'll sleep in separate rooms for a couple of days. Hmm. So you can, you can think about how you value this relationship and you can say it lovingly, warmly. Right. So. Thanks for fun. I, I had fun. I, I love I love your reinterpretation, you know, what I'm saying because it's absolutely, you know, you're you're taking what I'm saying and and you're putting it. Can I have one last word? Sure. Really? Okay. So again, just going back to establishing love being nourishment because I think that's where the skeptics come in. And by the way, I did a clinical trial with a team of physicians uh, up in Danbury Hospital and talking about skeptics and talking about people who have been trained uh, not to take care of themselves and the whole thing was about burnout. So what I had to do is teach them self-care through self-love and after they kind of got over that it's okay, <laughs> the word self-love is okay and it's okay to love themselves, uh, 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 we had we had surprisingly promising results uh, with the clinical trial ended December 2017. But here is the piece of it that that uh, that I gave them. Think of lo- nourishment, and we realize it's cyclical in nature. What do we mean? Uh, what do I mean by that? If I said to you, search, take a breath, because you need oxygen. Now take another breath, but don't breathe out. Just take another breath because you need oxygen. And then I said to you, okay, now take another breath because you need oxygen, but don't breathe out. And, of course, after a couple of breaths, people start laughing. You know, they can't hold their breath because we need to exhale. Same thing with food. You need food, so let's just keep giving you food. Make sure we're nourishing you, but we're not going to allow you to expel. And you're going to die. The same thing with water. And if we think about love, how important it is to give it, when we withhold love from people because we're upset with them, it's like holding our breath. It's almost more painful than not getting love. So people get dogs and flowers and, you know, they scrub their car 58 times, they wax it. <laughs> we have a need to love. So one of the things I teach people is that the only thing you can control is loving yourself and you can love other people. They cannot stop you. They may not want it, but that's their problem. You can still be loving. And it's so funny that in some of the relationships, uh, when, when people begin to be loving where it's not expected, people actually get angry with them. Because they, 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 they realize they don't deserve, you know, that's <laughs> what is going on. You know, I just, I was just an a-hole or whatever. And I, now you're being loving. Uh, so yeah, love is cyclical in nature. And that's, kind of the final proof I will uh, point to uh, that love, in fact, is nourishment like air, food, and water. In our system, it behaves exactly like air, food, and water. This recording is part of the Somatic Mindfulness and Relational Psychotherapy podcast. See the website, relationalimplicit.com.